fear of God is the result of faith in God. The person who loves God values knowledge of God more than anything created by God and pursues such knowledge ardently and ceaselessly. He who values the body more than the soul and the world created by God more than the Creator himself is simply a worshipper of idols. The person who loves God cannot help loving every man as himself, even though he is grieved by the passions of those who are not yet purified. But when they amend their lives, his delight is indescribable and knows no bounds. A soul filled with thoughts of sensual desire and hatred is unpurified. Blessed is he who can love all men equally. He forsakes all worldly desires, sets himself above all worldly distress. He who loves God will certainly love his neighbor as well. Such a person cannot hoard money, but distributes it in the way befitting God, being generous to everyone in need. The state of love may be recognized in the giving of money, and still more in the giving of spiritual counsel and in looking after people in their physical needs. The pure intellect is one divorced from ignorance and illumined by divine light. The pure soul is one freed from passions and constantly delighted by divine love. He who loves God lives the angelic life on earth, fasting and keeping vigils, praying and singing songs, always thinking good of every man. Do not permit any abuse of your spiritual father or encourage anyone who dishonors him. Otherwise, the Lord will be angry with your conduct and will obliterate you from the land of the living. If you are not indifferent to both fame and dishonor, riches and poverty, pleasure and distress, you have not yet acquired perfect love. For perfect love is indifferent not only to these, but even to this fleeting life and to death. Almsgiving heals the soul's insensitive power, fasting with a sensual desire, prayer purifies the intellect and prepares it for the contemplation of created beings. For the Lord has given us commandments which correspond to the powers of the soul. When a sparrow tied by the lake tries to fly, it is held back by the string and pulled down to the earth. Similarly, when the intellect that has not yet attained this passion flies up towards heavenly knowledge, it is held back by the passions and pulled down to the earth. When during prayer no conceptual image of anything worldly disturbs your intellect, then know that you are within the realm of discretion. For the war which the demons wage against us by means of thoughts is more severe than the war they wage by means of material things. Whatever a man loves, he inevitably clings to, and in order not to lose it, he rejects everything that keeps him from it. So he who loves God cultivates pure prayer, driving out every passion that keeps from it. He who drives out self-love, the mother of the passions, will with God's help easily rid himself of the rest, such as anger, irritation, rancor, and so on. But he who is dominated by self-love is overpowered by the other passions, even against his will. Self-love is the passion of attachment to the body. If there are some men you hate and some you neither love nor hate, and others you love strongly and others again you love but moderately, 
Recognize from the inequality that you are far from perfect love. For perfect love presupposes that love all men equally. He who anoints his intellect for spiritual contests and drives all impassioned thoughts out of it has the quality of a deacon. He who illuminates his intellect with the knowledge of created beings and utterly destroys false knowledge has the quality of a priest. And he who perfects his intellect with the holy myrrh of the knowledge and worship of the Holy Trinity has the quality of a bishop. The trivialists, therefore, who divide the Son from the Father, find themselves in a dilemma. Either they say the Son is co-eternal with the Father, but nevertheless divide him from the Father, and so they are forced to say that he is not begotten from the Father. Thus they fall into the error of claiming that there are three gods and three first principles. Or else they say that the Son is begotten from the Father but nevertheless divide him from the Father. And so they are forced to say that he is not coternal with the Father. Thus they make the Lord of time subject to time. For it belonged to God alone to be the end and the completion and the impassable. God is unmoved and complete and impassable. It belongs to creatures to be moved toward that end which is without beginning, and to come to rest in the perfect end that is without end, and to experience that which is without definition, but not to be such or to become such an essence. For whatever comes into being and is created is certainly not absolute. Through the abundant grace of the Spirit, it will be shown that God alone is at work, and in all things there will be only one activity, that of God and of those worthy of kinship with God. God will be all in all, wholly penetrating all who are His in a way that is appropriate to each. If someone is moved according to the Logos, he will come to be in God, in whom the Logos of His being pre-exists as His beginning and cause. Furthermore, if He is moved by desire and wants to attain nothing else than His own beginning, he does not flow away from God. Rather, by constant straining toward God, he becomes God and is called a portion of God because he has become fit to participate in God. By gracious condescension, God became man and is called man for the sake of man. And by exchanging his condition for ours, revealed the power that elevates man through his love for God and brings God down to man because of his love for man. By this blessed conversion, man is made God by divinization and God is made man by harmonization. For the word of God and God wills always and in all things to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. For what is more desirable to God's precious ones than to be divinized? That is for God to be united with those who have become gods and by his goodness to make everything his own. He became the new Adam by assuming a sinless creaturely origin and yet submitting to a passable birth. Perfectly combining the two parts in himself in a reciprocal relation, he effectively rectified the deficiency of the one with the extreme of the other, and vice versa, by causing his birth amid dishonor to save and renew his honorable creaturely origin and, conversely, by making his creaturely origin sustain and preserve his birth. God innovated human nature in terms of its mold, not its principle by assuming flesh mediated by an intelligent soul, for he was ineffably conceived without human seed, 
and truly begotten as perfect man without corruption, having an intelligent soul together with his he body then, from the very same moment in his philanthropy willing to became a man amid our transgression, voluntarily subjected himself to condemnation along with us. He who is alone truly free and sinless consented to a bodily birth in which lay the very power of our condemnation and thereby mystically restored the birth of the Spirit. Therefore the word of the Holy Scripture remains good and noble, always offering spiritual truth in place of the literal for those who lay hold of its saving meaning with the eyes of the soul. The scriptural word contains nothing slanderous of God or his holy angels. The divine Logos assumed our human nature without altering his divinity and became perfect man in every way like us save without sin. As well, it would be shown that it is God who, by using the flesh as bait, conquers the devil rather than the devil conquering man by promising a divine nature. It is this worm who smote the gourd plant and caused it to wider or in other words, who abolished the observance of law like a mere shadow and dried up the Jew's arrogance over that observance. Clearly he won the victory over them for our sake, not for his own, and it was for us that he became a man and, in his goodness, inaugurated a complete restoration. For he himself did not need the experience, since he is God and sovereign and by nature free from all passion. He submitted to it so that, by experiencing our temptations, he might provoke the evil power and thwart its attack, putting to death the very power that expected to seduce him just as it had Adam in the beginning. If, however, you understand the subject of the phrase let not what I will, but what you will prevail to be not the man just like us but the man we consider as Savior, then you have confessed the ultimate concurrence of his human will with the divine will, which both his and the Father's, and you have demonstrated that with the duality of his natures there are two wills, the lessings, and the two operations, energei respective to the two natures, and that he admits of no opposition between them, even though he maintains all the while the difference between the two natures from which, in which, and which he is by nature. For if the divine is a since it fills all things, and everything that was brought from non-being to being is moved because it tends towards some end, then nothing that moves is yet endless. The movement driven by desire has not yet come to rest in that which is ultimately desired. If God made all things by his will which no one denies. And it is always pious and right to say that God knows his own will, and that he made each creature by an act of will. Then God knows existing things as he knows the products of his own will since he also made existing things by an act of will. Whoever intelligently examines the enigmas of the scriptures with a fear of God and for the sake of the divine glory alone, and removes the letter as though it were a curtain around the spirit, shall discover everything face to face, as the wise Proverbs says Prov 8, 9. No impediment will be found to the perfect motion of the mind towards divine things, 